Okay, let's see how this works. Okay, so Amazon's recommender system is a big barrier against new competitors, right? Basically, any new competitor that might want to come into the retail operation, retail sector, that's one thing they need to include. They need to have a pretty good recommender system, right, in order to successfully compete against Amazon. So, just in the big picture, what resources and data would be needed to replicate their system? Well, number one, they'd need years and years of large-scale transaction data, right? They need a customer base similar to Amazon's, carry a product line similar to Amazon's, and they need to have done it for like 20 years like Amazon has done. So basically that's not going to happen, right? And on top of that, of course, they would need all the hardware and everything else that's required to run that system. How long would it take to design, develop, and implement? It would probably take a pretty long time, right? So it's not something that, you know, a few guys are going to slap together in their dad's garage over the weekend. So it's a big effort. So, but we can ask this, what might be an equivalent substitute? What might another company do? to mimic Amazon's recommender system if they want it to be devious. Huh? Nothing? They could actually look up that product on Amazon and pull the things that Amazon recommends. They could run a script to do that. And that sounds kind of devious, and I suppose it is, but you know that information is out there in the public domain at that point. Uh, Bing actually had a little window where they were piggybacking off of Google like that. So if Bing came up with a, a request, you know, somebody put in a request that Bing had no idea how to respond to, it would sometimes go to Google, run that search on Google, pull the search results, and give those to the searcher. So, yeah, that happens. Anyway, so this is another example of uh, how scale benefits accrue. So Amazon is big, it's been around for a long time, so it has a lot of historical data, more products, more users all over a longer time. Because it has more data, it's going to reduce sampling error, right? So if you only have, say, three customers that have bought an item during some uh, long time interval, you don't, it's a pretty good chance, you know, that your data is not going to be great, right? There's going to be a lot of sampling error. It's a very small sample size. The chances that your sample correctly reflects the entire larger population of people, it's pretty unlikely. But Amazon, their sample size is so large that it's actually pretty good. Their sample error is down pretty low. And last, they can do trend analysis, right? They can do trend analysis with a sophistication that their competitors can't. So simple example, uh, Amazon is a $200 plus billion dollar a year company, right? So if they come up with some technique in their trend analysis that increases revenues by 1%, that's like 2.3 billion, right? That's substantial. They can afford to spend a lot of money designing good systems and good algorithms and hire people to crunch a lot of numbers. It's worth the trouble to do that. However, if you're some tiny dinky retailer that's doing like 20 million a year, right? You're never going to get that. Your trend analysis has to be so awesome that it literally doubles your revenues before you can even get 20 million, right? It's just, it's just you're not going to put in the same kind of effort. And this is the sort of thing, too, that, again, happens with Google versus Bing. Google is very big, so they can develop a more sophisticated model. Bing is, you know, a competitor, but it's a, a small and puny competitor compared to Google. They don't have the money. They, it's not worth the trouble for them to optimize it in the same way as it is for Google. Anyway, so all these advantages, these are by design, not by accident, right? Uh, the good people who were in charge of Amazon back in the day, they said, hey, if we get big, being big is going to solve a lot of our problems, right? Because a lot of things in the internet, there's really only room for one. Once one company gets big, it gets so many of these scale advantages that in practice nobody can compete. In fact, I looked up, uh, I recently looked up the... Uh, retail share of Amazon. Amazon is 40% of online retailing, all online retailing in the U.S. So huge, huge numbers. Okay, so you take like everybody else put together. Yeah, and Amazon is actually in, in more than half really because part of the rest of it is vendors selling through Amazon. Okay, so we'll talk about strategy. We'll start off with strategy today. So 
there's a range of meanings when people talk about strategy. There's a casual usage and there's a more specific business usage. So the casual usage of strategy basically means what I'm going to do in light of what all the other things other people might do, right? So like if you're playing a game of chess and you're thinking what move you're going to make, Okay, you have some kind of plan of why you're doing it, but you're thinking, well, in the big picture, if I do this, he's going to do this other stuff, and that's how the strategy is going to play out. Okay, and business usage, basically, it's similar, but it's business specific. So it's still a plan, but it's a plan for some kind of long-term organizational action. Like, what are you going to do over the next five years? And you're going to determine your strategy based on what you think all your competitors will possibly do and what the environment of the universe will be. So, key aspects of strategy, time, strategies for businesses tend to be measured in years, right? It's not, strategy isn't something that, oh, what are we gonna do this weekend? Scope, by definition, organizational strategy encompasses pretty much the entire organization. You can have functional strategies that only cover like one department, but organizational strategies scope the whole organization. Assets. Well, if it involves the whole organization over a long time, it is extremely probable that there will be a lot of uh, time and money involved, okay? Well, we've defined there's gonna be a lot of time, but time is money, so large, uh, you know, large usage of organizational assets. Okay, and again, organizational strategies, whole organization, functional strategies is for a particular department. Okay, now, We'll start off with the Porter's Five Forces model. So one of the things about research, that maybe you guys have noticed and maybe not, is that many resource, researchers like to come up with some clever new idea and then staple their name onto it, right? And this is a, a sort of immortality. So Porter, he's a guy who did this. You know what, before I talk about Porter, I'm gonna show you something. This is worth mentioning, if I can get internet. If I can get internet, I'll show you, and if I can't, I won't can't so you don't find out what it is maybe later okay so Porter looked at a lot of empirical data of uh, businesses and markets and was trying to figure out the question of how can some businesses basically have what's called a sustained competitive advantage that they make more profit than you would expect over a long period of time okay because here's the thing more competition means less potential for profit. We can all understand that pretty intuitively, right? If you have like a busy intersection, you might uh, have gas stations on two or three or even four corners of it, right? But the amount of traffic going by that intersection might not be enough to sustain it. So more competition means less potential for profit, but more profit means more competition. It's kind of a circular thing, right? It should sort of self-stabilize that the number of gas stations at that busy intersection, basically if they can't make money doing that, some of them will close down and maybe go somewhere else. Okay, so kind of circular. We ask, what's the question? What makes an advantage sustainable? Well, after looking through a whole bunch of data along a whole bunch of different industries, he found five forces that explain it. So, number one, competitive rivalry. So competitive rivalry is something basically how intense the co competition is. And that's typically resolved around the growth of the, the business sector. For example, what is a business that is in decline right now? Movie theaters. Movie theaters. You think? What's that? Taxi. Taxi. Oh, okay. Well, JCPenney is an industry. Yeah, we're in the retail apocalypse. We're also taxis are having trouble, right? So we would say in the case of taxis, we would say that ride sharing as a business is doing fine, but the taxi business within ride sharing is doing badly. Retail, online is doing well, offline not so much. The one that I would bring out, newspapers, right? People still read the news, but newspapers, you wouldn't want to be starting a new newspaper this year, right? Not a good business to be into. Well, what happens when a market is in decline like that, all the businesses are struggling to stay alive and they're gonna tend to cut prices to try to bring in a new, uh, you know, in a desperate attempt to stay on for a few more years to try to bring in some revenue. There's going to be a lot of uh, cost cutting. It's gonna bring down uh, profits because you know, in a declining market, if one newspaper says, hey, we're gonna bring up our price to like three bucks or five bucks for the Sunday paper, you know, good luck with that. It's not, not going to work. Okay. On the other hand, if a market is growing very quickly, 
it may be that all of the companies involved can barely keep up with demand. This was a, a good example would have been uh, smartphones around 2007, 2008, right? So as fast as Apple and some of the other operations could crank out smartphones, people were running out to buy them, right? It was an expanding market, and so there wasn't a whole lot of competitive rivalry yet. Okay, other two, bargaining power of customers, bargaining power of suppliers. Simply means if somebody can go somewhere else, you can't afford to charge a higher than expected uh, you know, rate for whatever you're selling. So imagine the case of McDonald's, right? So suppose I like McDonald's and I like a good burger every now and then. If McDonald's raises their price to $10, I mean, McDonald's makes a fine, you know, $1.29 burger, whatever it is. But if they raise their price up to $10, am I going to still eat at McDonald's? No. Not unless it's real close, right? Unless walking distance is a factor. Yeah, because there's lots of places downtown that'll sell you a good $10 burger, right? Yeah. So in the case of that, customers have a lot of bargaining power. Suppliers. Same kind of thing, right? So McDonald's, they buy meat from a lot of different places, right? They might buy meat from a lot of farmers. If one particular for like Farmer Joe out in, uh, I don't know, Nebraska, right? He's selling, he's selling meat to McDonald's and he says, you know what? I'm going to raise my price from a dollar a pound to five dollars a pound. Is McDonald's just going to have to take that? No, because there's a lot of farmers out there, right? A lot of ranchers selling meat to McDonald's for a dollar a pound. McDonald's has a lot of options, okay? So bargaining power tends to keep prices down. If you have other alternatives that you can't raise the price too much or people go use those alternatives. Likewise, threat of substitutes. Are there good substitutes for this product, right? Not other vendors selling the same product, but a different product that would uh, fill the need uh, sufficiently. So, for example, suppose I'm not talking specifically about burgers anymore. Suppose I'm just talking about lunch, okay? Now, it may be that I like burgers a lot, but I've been known to, you know, eat at Panda Express. I've been known to eat a McChicken at McDonald's from time to time, okay? Other stuff, uh, once in a while, sushi. I've been known to accept substitutes, right? Are there a lot of substitutes? If I don't, you know, if McDonald's raises its uh, price to $10 for a burger, even if there's no other burger vendors, there's a lot of other options for food, right? And some of those might be more attractive relative to a $10 McDonald's burger. And last, threat of new entrants. If new entrants can come into the market, that's going to be pressure back here on competitive rivalry, right? So if you have a case where there's a lot of new entrants coming into a market, yeah, that's gonna to tend to keep prices down because you're always gonna have that potential competitive rivalry. You had it, yes. Yes. That is an interesting question. Well, basically, uh, number one, it's a uh, it's a system with a lot of inertia built in. You know, the other thing, taxis are still sort of getting by because fundamentally it's a different market, right? The thing about Uber or Lyft, whatever. Maybe you want a taxi, you know, right now, right? You're wandering around and you say, oh, I could do this. There might not be an Uber or a Lyft available at the moment, right? And you might have to wait a while. Or the prices, you know, with the, the peak time, the prices might bump up enough that actually a taxi starts to look not so bad. So, yeah, I, you know what? But the, the short answer is the taxis, for some reason, they have not adjusted their prices, made it more flexible. It would require a lot of technology to do that. They don't want to just, you know, blanket cut their prices, but they don't want to spend the whole bunch of money to, you know, adjust prices dynamically either. What, Uber? Uber and Lyft would be uh, new entrants in terms of uh, when they first hit taxis, right? But then... I would say it's more a bargaining power of customers, right? So if you don't want, if the taxi prices are high, you say, hey, I'm going to go to Uber or Lyft. And if, you know, it's peak time for Lyft, but not for Uber, you're going to go to Uber, right? That's bargaining power. You have other options. Other options for the same product. Yeah. Okay. All right. So 
Good examples, right? Sustainable advantage, sustainable higher than average profitability. So for a long time, taxis, right? They deliberately kept the uh, number of taxis artificially low because they only issued so many medallions. So there can only be so many li licensed taxis in an environment. And that kept the prices high. There was more demand than there, was, than there were taxis. Other stuff, prime hotel location, right? So if you can set up a beachfront hotel in Hawaii, you're always gonna be able to charge extra for that versus a hotel that's even like a block inland, right? People like to be right on the beach and they'll pay a premium for that. Any kind of control of limited resources, right? So think of uh, diamond mining in South Africa. That's been a big one. Uh, there are all kinds of rare minerals that are used in smartphones that are only found in a few places. Anything that's a limited resource and is not easily, you know, is not really easily substituted by something else, right? Because diamonds, for whatever reason, diamonds have come to be uh, symbolic of wedding rings, engagement rings, and people aren't going to accept, you know, an equally pretty non-diamond rock in most cases. So, uh, any long-term exclusive contract, right? So that's how come the, uh, you know, all these uh, cell phone people, they want to get you on contract, so they say, okay, we can you know, have it be a little more expensive. But it's not just with uh, cell phones either. It's with anything. You have uh, some defense contractor that says, uh, we are going to be the sole provider of, you know, ammunition or fighter jets or whatever for the next 20 years to the government. Yeah, they're going to squeeze a lot of money out of that. And last, anything that you can supply continuous innovation. So companies like Apple, they've been pretty good with that. Uh, Amazon, Facebook, They've always been able to add on new features or respond to uh, consumer issues. If you can continuously change your product so that there, are no, there aren't good substitutes for it, then yeah, you'll be able to charge extra. And if you think about this for a second, this really uh, ties into the iPhone, right? When iPhones first came around, they could basically charge you, you know, $1,000 plus your firstborn child and people would show up and still buy them because there weren't a lot of alternatives. Five years later, yeah, there's a lot of phones out there, right? Samsung, these other companies, they're making, you know, pretty good phones. They're not iPhones, so they don't have that cachet, but customers have a lot more bargaining power. So if Apple is able to continuously innovate and keep on making new and better phones, then yeah, they stay with an advantage. If they can't, right, then customers have more bargaining power and Apple's going to have to decrease its prices. Okay. Now, of course, sustainable doesn't mean permanent, right? Nothing's really permanent. So it just means, yeah, you'll be able to keep on getting uh, extra money as long as this case is true. For example, GM, right, in the window right after World War II, when uh, the U.S. had basically the only large-scale functioning industrial economy, right? Uh, Germany and Japan were smoking wrecks. Russia was kind of burned out. Uh, the U.K. was kind of burned out. They were, you know, they were kind of done. Uh, the U.S. had by far the biggest industrial sector of any country on Earth. And GM was representative of that. Just, you know, instead of cranking out tanks and Jeeps and stuff, they started cranking out cars for consumers. So for a long time, their situation was really good. But what happened? Well, labor started asking for more money. The car designers got sloppy and they started uh, stop paying attention to quality. And the Japanese showed up and ate their lunch. So over time, right? decades, things can go wrong. But for a long time, GM had it pretty good. Okay. Now, strategy development is a fairly standard process, but we're going to look at the two by two matrix first. So everybody likes two by two matrices because they're easy to understand. You have two cases of this, not this, and another this, not this. So what strategy exists to find out fundamentally is the intersection of what is possible with what leads to a good outcome, right? So the organization looks at basically the things it can do. Some of the things are not gonna be possible and they're gonna say, wow, we'd love to do that, but we don't really see ourselves doing it, okay? The other thing, something might be possible, but not a good idea. So good outcome versus bad outcome. So simple example, suppose, uh, I don't know, who's a, uh, a non-tech company? This will give a real obvious one. Suppose Target, right? Target sees, hey, there's a lot of people coming through Target to buy furniture, okay? And we've been buying furniture and reselling it from uh, outside manufacturers. 
How about if Target manufactures its own furniture in its own factories? Well, that might not be possible in practice, right? Not practical in the short term in the sense that, well, they don't have a lot of expertise designing furniture. You know, they have some idea of what's going to sell, but they might not just might just not be geared up to be furniture manufacturers, right? The best case thing, maybe they can buy some of the vendors they've been buying from, but then they look at their balance sheet and they say, you know what, they actually have a lower rate of return on their manufacturing than we do on our retailing, so it wouldn't make sense for us to buy them and water down our profits, okay? So they might look at that and say, yeah, it's not really feasible, right? It's, you know, it's theoretically possible, but it's not possible in the sense that this is not something we're gonna do. The other things, what's possible good outcome versus bad outcome, that's always probabilistic, right? So Target might say, you know what? If we did get this furniture, suppose they decided that buying furniture was possible. They said, you know what? One of our vendors that makes the furniture, they're actually looking for a buyer. We could go in and buy them. That would be possible and it wouldn't really affect our supply chain much. We could do it. But good outcome versus bad outcome, right? They might decide, oh, that's probably kind of a bad outcome because the reason why they're looking to sell is because they're in financial trouble. If we buy them, we acquire all that financial trouble. We're not going to make money off that. The best thing to do is to continue our ongoing relationship with them and buy relatively cheap furniture from them and not deal with any of the headaches from you know their flailing, failing business. Okay, so that's what strategy is essentially looking at first what's possible versus not possible, and then among the things that are possible, trying to figure out what gets us to the money. Okay, so when you're developing a strategy, you have to consider the internal and external environment. So the internal environment is your organizational capabilities fundamentally, what you can do. Your external environment is basically the market for the product, what your competitors are doing, things like that. And this is exemplified by what's called a SWOT analysis. SWOT analysis is a ridiculous sounding word, right? It's a phrase, but I assure you, this is what businesses use. My wife is a uh, uh, senior manager. Uh, is that her title still? Yeah, I think so. She's a senior manager at Accenture, so she manages product projects. And she'll say, oh yeah, I'm gonna have some analysts do like a SWOT analysis. So like once every couple months, I hear you know that phrase from uh, the basement office. So, SWOT analysis is a real thing. And what the letters stand for, S and W stand for strengths and weaknesses. That's the internal stuff, the things your organization is good at, the things you're not good at. External is opportunities and threats. Opportunities, ways that you have an opportunity to make money, right? Some good opportunity coming your way. A threat is something that's gonna cut into that. So, of course the ideal case is you find some large scale opportunity that can be exploited by your existing strengths, right? So in the case of Apple, right, flashback to 2005, they thought, hey, this Blackberries are pretty good. We could design something like that, but we could make it a lot better. And hey, nobody else is doing that right now. So large scale opportunity exploited by existing strengths, right? Apple had already shown that they were pretty good at devi devising innovative products like the uh, iPod, and they said, okay, we'll do something else. We'll do the iPhone. We'll see how it goes. And it worked out pretty well. Okay. Now, strategy starts with awareness. So business has to be aware of its own strengths and weaknesses. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. But the big one is you just track what people know, right? So past performance. Everybody that's been involved on anything, uh, any kind of project, you track what their initial state of knowledge is, and you estimate what they have learned through the course of that project. You also track individuals as part of teams and say, hey, they were on this project, we're gonna estimate you know, the difficulty of what they were doing, we're gonna see how they did. We're gonna learn about the capabilities of all the people in our organization. And at a good organization, that's exactly the sort of thing they do. So after some project is completed, they update everybody's file about what they know, what skills they have, how well they did, and the business knows. Okay. Other things, if you don't have that kind of long uh, history, you can do some kind of pilot effort, right? So you could say, all right, we want to design uh, a new smartphone. So Apple gathers together, you know, a few teams of engineers that they think are promising and say, okay, you guys, talk about building a smartphone. What can you do? How would it look? You know, how much would it cost to make? Design a prototype, things like that. So 
Some combination of those two is basically how you do it. It's good if you have the information on hand, but if you don't have the information on hand, you know, ultimately you got to try something. Externally, right, the information is a little bit harder to get, but what you should know, competitors' capabilities to the extent that you can measure how well they're doing, uh, your business partner's capabilities. For example, if you have supplier, you want to design some new smartphone, but you don't have any suppliers that can bring you the components that your engineers tell you are necessary. Okay, product demand and potential substitutes, right? How much of it you think you're gonna sell? So some of it is about, you know, other organizations and some of it is about the market for the product. Okay, last little bit as far as uh, all this, the big umbrella over all this strategy, okay? Doctrine, culture, and branding. So in a sense, they're kind of the same thing. Uh, doctrine is more of a military term. Uh, so the idea is basically how your armed forces is go are going to fight. So for example, suppose you have a big potentially threatening country next to a smaller not so threatening company uh, country. And let's take as an example, I don't know, let's take the Federation of Independent States or Russia, let's take them next to Norway. They do share a small border, okay? so. To the extent that a military confrontation could happen, you know, I would assume that uh, Russia's posture is more offensive in that regard, right? Uh, they've had some recent incidents in Ukraine, in Crimea, you know, they're, they're a little bit on the offense. So they have things like they have bombers to go in and blast stuff in other places. They have tanks that are basically an offensive weapon. On the other hand, Norway, Norway's not looking for a fight with Russia, right? Because if it happens, it's probably going to go pretty badly. Uh, so they have more of a defensive posture. So they have things like they have barbed wire, they have minefields, they have machine gun emplacements, they have anti-tank guns, anti-tank rocket emplacements, you know, radar systems, all that sort of stuff that's more of a defensive orientation, okay? So that, that's what doctrine means is basically how you plan you're going to fight. Same thing for culture in business. Culture in business is basically the way you're going to run your business. So, for example, Ethics, right? So you guys remember Enron, or you've at least, I guess you don't remember it, but you've heard of Enron. Yeah? If you haven't heard of Enron, you should watch the movie The Shortest, Smartest Guys in the Room uh, at some point. It's, it's very good. They might make you watch that in finance anyway. Uh, but the idea is, the short version of it, Enron did a lot of stuff that was technically legal, but it was right on the border of illegality. They did other stuff that was illegal, but a lot of what they did was technically legal, like creating shell companies within shell companies within shell companies. Uh, but it's not ethical, right? Legal and ethics, you'd like for them to overlap. They don't always. Uh, and so their, their business philosophy was make a buck however you've got to do it, okay? And it did not end up well for them. So... That was their culture, right? Other businesses would have, you know, the uh, approach of avoiding even the, the appearance of impropriety is one of the standard phrases. So basically, even if something isn't bad, but it might look bad, you don't do it. And that's business culture. Okay. So what that means in terms of strategy, options that are opposed to the doctrine or culture most likely won't even be considered. Okay. Similar thing with branding. So products that might be incompatible with a brand. So Wedding dresses, right? People buy wedding dresses. It's generally a chance to have a big expensive party. Most brides want to have a very expensive wedding dress because if not, then yeah, they, they don't feel good about themselves. So even though Walmart, right, could sell wedding dresses, could uh, probably put together a decent, you know, $50 wedding dress, whatever, people aren't going to really want to buy that. Right? It's kind of the equivalent of like a duct tape wedding dress that most people aren't in the market for. Likewise, mix sushi, right? People eat sushi. It's kind of an expensive thing, at least in the United States. McDonald's could probably slap together a decent $1 sushi roll, but people who go to McDonald's probably aren't looking to eat sushi. Well, I don't know. Maybe they have it in Japan by now. I don't know. Okay? Anyway, it's just kind of incompatible, right? Or a more extreme version, gas station sushi, right? You might be like, ooh, I don't know about that, right? So this is the basic thing. These are filters that limit the strategic options that are likely to get considered. Okay. Now, strategic alignment. 
So a business is composed of all various departments that have to work together, right? Things like operations, actually doing the work, finance, getting the money, marketing, getting the word out, HR, hiring people, and IT. So suppose, for example, you have this business case, you have a bicycle manufacturer wants to increase sales by 10% by next year. How might they cooperate? What are some issues that might come up? Well, first, have to decide, okay, so goal, increase sales by 10% over the next year. Okay, that, that's your goal. We'll say that's a strategic goal. So how might you do that? How might this be achieved? Okay, and there's two basic flavors of how to do it. One is you sell more bikes. What's the other? Yeah, you raise prices. Presumably, maybe you raise quality, right? Because, yeah, so either sell more bikes or sell same number but more expensive bikes, right? And those are the two big flavors of the strategy. But suppose... Suppose after some thought, the organization decides to upgrade its bike models, okay? It says, we're going with the second option. We're gonna to try to sell same number, but higher quality bikes. How might the functional strategies follow the organizational strategy, okay? So for example, what are operations gonna have to do? Operations as actually making the stuff, what's gonna change for them? They gotta design a new model of bike, right? Maybe a whole new product line. So design and manufacture new bikes could require new Equipment as well, right? New manufacturing equipment. So that's definitely, they're definitely going to have to design these things. Maybe they can build them on their old equipment, but maybe part of being better is they're going to have to get, you know, more advanced manufacturing equipment to do it. Okay. What about finance? What are they going to have to do? What does finance do in a business? Yeah, they're controlling funding, right? So they have to get money for any expensive new efforts, right? Like new equipment. They're gonna be in charge of that. So that's what they're gonna be looking at. Marketing, what about marketing? What are they gonna do? Yeah, like what? Sure, but give, give me something concrete. They will add, they're gonna make an ad. Okay, what kind of ad? A commercial, yeah, but I mean, what's going to, roughly speaking, be the content of the ad? Yeah, okay. Make a new ad uh, selling viewers on the virtues of the new bikes, right? Say, hey, your old bike was okay, but check this out, right? Something along those lines. What else? Who do you think are probable customers for these new bikes? Possibly, but fundamentally what we have here, we have an updated version of an old bike. So who would it make sense to really target with this? Previous customers that bought the bike a while ago, right? So target customers who bought the old bike a while back and could be ready for repurchase, okay? You already know their customers, they like the old bike enough to buy it. The bike's been around for maybe five, 10 years, who knows? You could say, hey, you know, that old bike that we sold you, it was great, but look what we got now, okay? Might be a better targeting effort than trying to send out flyers to everybody on earth. Okay, so you get the idea? So whatever's going on in here, like at HR, right? Hire new people, that's what they do. So combination of engineers, uh, ad people, whatever. Okay, you get the idea. And IT, new systems to 
support the effort. So maybe, like maybe a CRM system, customer relationship management. Maybe you don't have a really good one. Maybe you have like a crappy old pencil and paper one that you've been managing for 50 years. And you say, well, if we're gonna do some kind of advanced analytics and see how this is all going, we need to transition from this ridiculously outdated paper system to something more cutting edge, okay? Stuff like that. That's all the sort of things that go on. So all these functional strategies, they're things they're going to do. They're going to do it to support the overall organizational goal of increasing sales by introducing a new superior line of bikes. Okay. Now, any big strategy shift almost inevitably is going to require changes to information systems. So information systems exist to fulfill business needs, right? You don't just build them as expensive toys. And the needs arise as part of a strategy. So system development happens because of strategic planning. You have some plan. We want to make a new line of bikes. We need IT systems that will help support that. Okay, so big picture sequence, and again, don't really need to memorize this, but hopefully you can look at it, understand it, and it makes sense. For strategy, evaluate the situation, your internal and external situation. Choose your organizational strategy, right? Based on what's going on in the universe, you say, this is what we're gonna try to do, right? Big picture, we'll worry about the details afterward. Here are the details, supporting functional strategies, and those can be broken down into individual tactics and all the things they're gonna do. And then, once you figured out all the stuff that's going to happen, at that point, you can talk about new information systems, right? Because unless you say, oh, our marketing people are going to need a new customer relationship management system, you're not going to have the IT people go ahead and build one. Yes, uh, anything? Questions? Does that all make sense? Uh, questions? Okay. So... Talk a little bit more specifically about Amazon. Uh, so, Amazon early on, their sales were to exponentially increase sales, right? They were doubling like every month for a little while. And fundamentally, their question was, what can a website provide beyond a catalog, right? Back in the 90s, catalogs were old news, right? The Sears catalog had been around for like 100 years. It was not a new thing. But the question is, what can a website do that a catalog can't? I'll ask you, what can a website do that a catalog can't? What's that? Sure, okay, show videos, show more detailed content, yeah. Yeah, have a reaction, right? Uh, in particular, it can be formatted uniquely for particular customers, right? So one catalog you send out, you're gonna basically print out a million copies of that and send the same catalog to everybody. At best, you might make regional versions of a catalog. With a website, Everything on a website can potentially be customized, right? So the layout of the site, the products that appear on the front page, things that you've recently bought, products that go along with that, all that can be customized for you, okay? And again, we're talking about recommender systems, so you can implement a recommender system in a website. Fundamentally, you can't in a catalog, or you can't easily. You'd have to print every catalog separately, which would massively increase the price. Okay, so Amazon's initial problem Number one, huge product line, right? Basically, every book in existence Amazon could get for you makes it very difficult for users to search. If a user knows exactly what they're looking for, yeah, you can find it. But if a customer shows up, they're like, oh, somebody's got a birthday coming up, or I'm bored, I want to buy a book. A lot of customers just show up, they want to buy a book. They don't know what they want, and it's a big hassle to dig through like a list of a million titles to try to figure out what they do want. On the other hand, Amazon eventually has a lot of historical purchase correlation data, right? So they can do a pretty good job. They're starting to be able to do a good job of suggesting products within a, you know, for a particular customer. So Amazon's solution to this, to this problem, was to try to reduce customer effort through a recommender system, give customers the information they need to make it easy for them to find something they like. Okay, so value chains. Every organization, in a sense, converts inputs to outputs for sale. Those outputs, you know, could be something tangible, could be intangible, like knowledge, like you guys are hopefully getting here. Uh, and it's called a value chain because at each step, the value to the customers should be greater, right? The increase in value should be greater than the costs of the inputs and the processing costs. So at every step of the value chain, you should be making the product somehow more valuable. It could be you're doing processing on it. 
right? Like you're turning components and assembling them together into a final bicycle, or it could be that you're shipping the bicycle from your warehouse, from your uh, factory to a retailer, in which case it's closer. All that is somehow adding value. So for Amazon, online bookstore in 1996, what are its inputs, what are its outputs, what processing happens? We'll very briefly talk about that. Okay. What happens at Amazon fundamentally? How, what is the model? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? What happens? What are people buying from Amazon in 1996? Books, yeah, books pretty much. Okay, so books are the output, right? What's the input? No, no, the input into the, into the system. So Amazon is taking some stuff, converting it to a product that's saleable, and people are buying it. So what's, what's the input? No, no, not, not a tech thing. The input is books, okay? This is books. This is not a manufacturing operation. If it were a manufacturing operation, it would be like pieces of paper and ink and glue and mixing them all together to make a book. But fundamentally, Amazon is what's called like a switchboard type of operation where it connects with customers on one side and it connects with booksellers on the other side and essentially links them together. So what processing is Amazon doing? What is the value that Amazon is adding? Yeah, let's say order fulfillment. Okay, Amazon is arranging for purchase and bundling books together and shipping them, right? That's what you get. So instead of having to go out to three separate uh, publishers and buy the books individually from their warehouse or go out to you know some physical bookstore, you show up to the Amazon site, you say, hey, here's what I want to buy, and Amazon gets to them to you in a few days. Okay, that's the service they're providing. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Now, Flashback, right, 1995, this is what Amazon's website looked like in 1995. Let's see, hey, we got this. Not much there, okay? Not like it is now. Oh, you can't see what I'm doing, as usual. Okay. You still can't see what I'm doing. What the hell? Eh. All right, well, it'll show up on this. There we go. That only took a year. Okay, Amazon.com books. This was their old website. So they had a few things, but their recommender system was essentially list-driven. So you could browse their million title catalog. Yeah, good luck with that. Or they had a few recommender lists in 20 categories, right? That was what they had. So if you like these kind of things, yeah, they can, they can get you that. Okay, so... Their core process flow, customer visits the website, orders the books, Amazon puts the order together, packages it, ships it. That's what happens. Now, we'll talk very briefly about value chain components, the two different kinds in it. Primary activities. Primary activities are things that add value. It's very clear that they add value. They do it directly and it's easy to measure. So, an example, Packaging and shipping, right? You know how much it costs to ship something, right? You can see the, the rate is like $4. You know that, uh, you know, the cost of the boxes is like 50 cents. So that's how much it costs Amazon. If they can charge $5 or $6 for shipping, they're making money. It's pretty easy to measure. Secondary stuff indirectly adds value, difficult to quantify. So one example. Customer support, right? We know if an organization like Amazon has zero customer support, it's going to be a problem, right? But on the other hand, there's definitely an upper bound on customer support where you have more people on hand and you're providing better service. Nobody has to wait to talk to somebody, but it's going to cost you a lot, okay? So it does add some value, but it's a lot harder to measure the value of customer support than it is to measure whether you're making money off of shipping or not. So, last thing, last thing, changing the value chain. Anytime you change the value chain, right, change some sequence of the process, 
is going to change the chain itself. It could add or remove steps, could change the value. Same thing, secondary functions, you might need to do something with that. So, fundamentally, when Amazon implements this recommender system, what changes? What changes? Well, less cognitive effort for customers means more return visits. Okay, that's a good thing. Means extra sales because what the recommender system can actually recommend things and will require new IT system, right? You're gonna have to actually implement a serious recommender system instead of just a set of 20 top 10 lists. It's gonna change your value chain. All right, this is a good break point.